Welcome back to the Debrief, that comp climbing show where we discuss the headlines, winners, and losers from the World Cups uh, of the past weekend. As always, my name's Tyler Norton. I'm John. De- I'm joined, like I always am, by John Bergman. He writes the climbing uh, or the competition recaps for Climbing Magazine, and of course, also writes for Climbing Business Journal, and is the author of High Drama: The Rise, Fall, and Rebirth of American Competition Climbing. And our special guest this week. Uh, if you've if you've been around since before COVID, you probably don't need an introduction. Probably one of those rare few people we can say that. But if you're new, if you haven't been in the sport uh, since before COVID, Mike Langley joining us from the London area is uh, is a, a wall manager, operator, route setter, and more relevantly to what we're talking about, he was an IFSC commentator for a couple of years, particularly in that Charlie Bosco era. Uh, and I guess I guess the 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 big achievement for you was being the commentator for the BBC broadcast of the Tokyo 2020. Olympics the climbing there so Mike welcome thanks so much for uh, for thanks so much for phoning in <laughs> yeah thanks guys I appreciate obviously putting these debriefs together I know it's not easy and I have been following them for for quite a few years now back in the day wondering what you were saying about me uh, but nowadays just joining in and uh, yeah really looking forward to this one Hopefully we didn't say anything too uh, too critical, but you never know. Sometimes we just have bad days, you know. Uh, well, I wanted to, you know, let's start there. I want to ask just because, uh, you know, we we spoke to uh, Charlie. Actually, even speaking to Eddie Falk, there was kind of this, you know, after COVID, there was all these names that we didn't see back as fixtures on the circuit. So Charlie kind of wrapped up. I think his intention was to wrap up with Tokyo. So that was a little more expected. But for you, we, we haven't seen back since on the IFSC circuit, even though, you know, you were there at the, the 2018 World Championships. Um, I can't remember if you were at the Hachioji one as well, just off the top of my head. Yeah, it was, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so you kind of became a fixture. So for yourself, was was it also the kind of thing where you were just going to be done when, when, uh, when Tokyo was over? Or was it a bit more of a surprise that you weren't you know involved after that yeah it's a good question i would like to say that i was i was planning on just going out you know this high at the, the tokyo games but for me that was that was obviously something that I was aiming towards but didn't really have my heart set on commentating at some in some some respect or some degree for the for the games but you know i started uh, 2016 at the world championships paris and just was just kind of like happened to be the right place at the right time as with a lot of these things and that built up for 2017 IFSC season season 2018 by the time we got to 2019 Hatchiogi World Championships Youth World Championships loads of mad stuff happening you know out there in Hatchiogi with the Olympic qualifiers and everything everything was going was going really really well and my role was always there to support Charlie with my route setting knowledge and picking up with um, you know obviously picking up on what the climbs are up to the, the techniques, the, the the specifics that he he obviously couldn't focus on at the same time as trying to run the scores and the clock and everything else you have to do with commentary, um, and then when 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 COVID struck, it was kind of that seemed to be like a bit of a line drawn under that. Everything went to hell really, um, and and so many of the comps just got binned. And from that point onwards, I think it was it seemed to be a natural a natural break for the IFC for some reason. And um, Matt was the obvious choice at that time because. He was in mainland Europe. He was obviously in France. A lot of the comps were really close by and all the travel restrictions and stuff. You know, I, I even had flights booked um, that are never used for the Briançon Lead World Cup that summer and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, one thing led to another a kind of fairly busy guy. And, um, yeah, I, I miss elements of it, but certainly don't miss the, you know, the, the, the hard the hard travel many, many, many days uh, away from the family and, and away from my work here in London yeah, it's it's something I still do. Still did the studio block masters. Got British Championships coming up in a few weeks. Um, bits and bobs here and there, um, but the golden days of Charlie and me are sadly sadly no more. It does seem, you know, we get we get some commentators that get a chance to get a sense of the flow of things, and then for whatever reason, it just falls off, and we seem to go through this cycle of, you know, you know, I don't, I don't you know, hold anybody for having bad intentions or, or, or whatever in, in, uh, commentary, but it does feel like we just have for, for whatever reason, we decide to do a hard restart every couple of years. And maybe that's the commentator's choice or not, but sometimes it feels like, man, we're not quite getting a chance to develop the, the nature of climbing commentary. Well, I think climbing commentary, commentary, I mean, you guys are obviously like really into this. You will know as well as I do that it is hard to get right, and I still, even today, don't think we found our feet with what is the right tone for climbing. You know, do we want to be talking constantly? Or do we want to be letting things breathe in the big moments? I'll be using athletes still as co-commentators, and 
I feel like back in 2019, Charlie and I, we had a had a, a partnership that was working where, like I said, I got to focus on those details and you knew what you're going to get each weekend. It would be us guys, uh, you know, sadly for some, but you get the you get that consistency and you, you knew that you were going to get some fairly decent coverage. And when it came to interviewing athletes and stuff, you knew you were going to get Charlie and I could I could hold the mic for uh, for that. So that awkward period that we're, we're seeing at the moment where people are, you know, athletes are trying to do post-match interviews and stuff. Um, um, I guess, you know, budget is a budget though, and it's not, it's not cheap sending guys all around the world to, to commentate on climbing. And sadly, yeah, sadly that's where we are. Somehow the budgets are, are just smaller now that we're, now that we're an Olympic uh, uh, sport, I guess, who knows how that works. But anyway, um, <laughs> as everybody knows, no uh, we're going to hit the headlines, we're going to hit the winners and we're going to hit the losers. Uh, and I'm really happy that we actually, it turns out we've got somebody that is a root setter by trade to talk about this comp, because I think, especially in the discussions among the public, that was a really big element for all of this, but we'll get to that when we get to it. Let's start with the headlines. As always, the guest goes first. So Mike, what was the headline from Innsbruck 20? 23 yeah i mean for me obviously it's been a it's been a long week of climbing but you know ask people around the gym this morning did you watch the world cups at the weekend and there's only one name that people are talking about and that's obviously Yanya. maybe no surprises no fireworks just here but the double gold and the emotional wins for Yanya, that was a that was a real moment and you know all the comments she's the goat and everything just one more time like just the way that she performs and the way that she's come back from the injury and the way that she actually showed emotion i think was a true sporting moment and that's what we want to see we don't want to see robots just out there every week like you can tell that she is under a lot of pressure and she i'm not sure if that pressure is just from her on herself but also she you know the, the slovenian team the coaches everyone who must be leaning on her to perform and for her to come out and, and do what she did um i in sport i i i like my superheroes to remain superheroes you know i don't like to see careers dragged out forever and it just gets worse and worse and I was worried that you know the first couple of um rounds when she was back like okay you know she's not just straight directly to the top I can't remember the exact result from the last few weeks but it wasn't just like boom first um and I, I think that that showed that she is she is human and she has emotion and and for her to do that and then come out and do lead as well like in the lead she was clearly completely boxed by the top and even in the in the interview she was just like um i was just you know clinging on in there you know i was just doing everything i could to hang on the wall and the way that she handled herself in the in the interview I just said i'm just truly grateful and i thought that was that was really sporting of her and, and really interesting and she said i think what's the, i've got the quote here somewhere just saying that yeah um it was a hard route just the way i like it and and that's what that's what i wanted to see from her she just like a, a, a battle which actually reminded me a little bit of how she performed in the lead final in the olympics it had that same sort of tension about it for me um obviously the Innsbruck world cup is not the same as a, a gold medal olympics but the way that she was climbing she was tr trying like you could see her genuinely trying hard um, yeah, for me, that's the headline. Just back-to-back -back goals is is impressive on a schedule like that. John, we only get to see her twice so far this season, and she's like, you know, you know, she's back twice, and she's the obvious headline. How does it all? How does that? How does that math that up? Yeah, it's funny because I was watching at the at the beginning of this this Innsbruck World Cup with the bouldering, and when Yanya won that, I was thinking, yeah. You know, Okay, that is definitely a highlight, Yanya winning the bouldering. But I knew that there was still so much climbing yet to come with the other disciplines and, and what and whatnot. I was kind of worried. I was like, well, it feels like maybe the climax of this competition happened too early, right? It happened first with Yanya winning the boulder discipline. And I was thinking by the time we get to the end of the lead discipline, I wonder if Yanya's accomplishment is kind of going to get lost in the shuffle and uh and then luckily as things turned Ye of out, little she faith ended, she ended up winning the lead <laughs> as well so she kind of kept herself in the headlines there so to speak uh, it was an amazing performance and i've got a lot to say about it but what i'll focus on now is tyler something that you and i have talked about is how much she kind of needed this win or needed a gold medal i think that this double gold I, either one of them would have been wonderful but the fact that she got two i think that this will kind of be a big waypoint in her career when you look back on it because if we remember tyler help me out here she won 
the the gold in Mayringen last year. 2022, uh, yeah. 2022, and then she came back this year, and up in, before Innsbruck here, she had only had a silver medal. And so I was like, okay, in the past year and a half, she has one silver medal, right? I think there was this big question of, like, is Yanya still the Yanya that we remember her as being? Or, or were we resigned to a future where maybe Yanya would have flashes of the greatness, but maybe it would be, you know, a silver medal here, a, a bronze medal here, a finals yeah. here. Maybe. Well, we, you know, we, we, we talked about the idea of like, how, how long can you coast on a gold medal from basically two years ago? Right. And like, we understand the European championships was in there too. So we understand that context, but there is a certain element of like, Hey, if you, if you want to keep being regarded as like the dominant climber of today, you do have to show up and you do have to beat some people. So silver was great coming back from, from an injury and, and from a long break and stuff, but there's kind Kind of a thing where you gotta you gotta like you know you know put it all out there and and prove to us that you're still on top and this weekend was was an incredible example of that that just left kind of no doubt uh that yeah she absolutely still has it obviously that injury is something that we can kind of put in the past and kind of get back on uh get back to the storylines that we were used to sad of course that we've had such inconsistent attendance from her over the last series of years in bouldering it makes for such you know an unsatisfying narrative to call her the best boulder of the day when you get to see her once or twice a year that just kind of leaves you wanting more honestly although that's a you know the primary rule of show business leave them wanting more so so what can you say about that <laughs> but but still yeah excellent performance and john to your point i still think the peak of the weekend was actually her bouldering win just that was certainly the most emotional moment of the competition when we get to see that from Yanya. Yeah, it just amplifies everything that we feel about her and it feels like almost that uh that all of the the love that that climbing sends to her it does feel like you're getting it back when it's like oh this matters as much to her as it does to all of us um which maybe sounds a little bit off but i think i think it's it uh it's nice to see that she loves it as much as as we do and all the all of the the hype and the and the story and the history that she's building it means a lot to know that she appreciates it even when it is you know it's just a world cup gold medal right it's not a world championship <laughs> it's not the world cup season it's not the olympics and still you know you fall to your knees literally right it's uh it was pretty incredible it, it, mike i'm i'm curious if you could if you can recall any moments when you've done commentary when you have gotten emotional as a result of maybe the competitor getting emotional because that was something I noticed in Matt Groom when Yanya she, she teared up I think before she even matched that last boulder and then yeah. she teared up again if people stuck around for the national anthem the podium ceremony she she kind of teared up a little bit then when the Slovenian national anthem was being played and and just a, a very uh, rare emotional display from Yanya of crying there. I think the only other times we've seen her tear up like that were when she swept the Boulder season in 2019 and when she won the Olympics. So, Tyler, to your point, I think that this this certainly meant a lot to her. And, yeah, Mike, can you recall ever uh, kind of um, seconding that emotion that the competitor is feeling? Yeah, I always think there's this interesting disparity between watching something on your screen and being at the venue. Um, there's it's just not even close watching, you know, watching the stream doesn't give you the feel of being at the venue at all. I'm sure you've both been to plenty of World Cups. So, you know, you must you must get that. And I think being there, you just get sucked up into this emotion so much easier than you do when you're kind of sitting on your sofa with, uh, you know, with someone cutting the lawn outside. It's, it's, it's very, very different. And yeah, I, I think sometimes it can feel when you're watching just to be like, okay, cool. You know, that, that obviously means a lot, but whatever, what's for dinner? Um, when you're when you're there, it's huge. And the one that stands out for me um, was the um, Jakob Schuber adam Andre moment at the Paris World Championships kind of back in the day when they both kind of essentially got to the second last move of Schubert and then Andre on the, on the very last moment. And that, that was absolutely huge. And that will live with me forever because I was, I was right there. You know, I, was, I stood right next to it, and it was it was crazy, and, and that that buzz just sucked. You know, you just you you felt it in the room. Like everybody was like, "Oh my God, what what is happening here?" Um, and I think Innsbruck. You know, what did they say? It's like the home of the home climbing's coming home was the the motto of this competition. I was like, "Well, that's 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 fairly that's a fairly bold move." Like yeah. in England, we've been saying. 
we've been saying football's been coming home since 1966 and that's still not happened so um for, to say it's coming home it is one thing but it looked like they absolutely nailed it i think that emotion in the crowd um, to have that whole arena completely packed out that's that's got to add into that experience for Yanya. and obviously the crowd is super loud um it's a, it's it's quite an intense venue it's kind of feels quite enclosed and um the times that i've been i've been there and it it does help to bring that emotion into the event and i would be really curious to know like behind the scenes what is going on with Yanya and her coaching team and her 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 sort of unit of of support because she's obviously like under a lot of pressure you don't just break down and cry from a win like we haven't seen that so much from her like you say so uh, or, or from any other athletes in that matter you know this is obviously something major that's cracked and think okay you know th th like you said Tyler this is a this is potentially a big big turning point in the career um which I I really like to see from a from a sporting perspective I think it's good to yeah good to see I think I think it's I can't think of anybody else who has the a reasonable expectation on them to win every Olympics that they show up to, right? I think that has to be the the crux of all of this, where you've got a team built around you and probably the Federation is has, over the last five years, has probably molded a lot of its operations to the fact that they have this almost like certain asset in Yanya Garnbrett, probably winning the Olympics when she shows up, probably winning the world championships when she shows up, right? And so I have to imagine there is this incredible pressure of, you know, from from a lot of the people that have this interest in her performance that the more she can produce in terms of medals, that really helps that entire ecosystem in Slovenia. Um, whether or not it's poorly intentioned, I don't mean to suggest that there's, you know, like the fat cats, like, you know, in the back pulling the strings or whatever, <laughs> but there's certainly a certain amount of interest and, you know, uh, uh, rising tide lifts all boats kind of thing. Um, but I think just the buildup of all this coaching around you, unlike all these other people who are just trying to like peak for world championships, maybe I can qualify. Yanya's entire career is peaking for the Olympics. It's just like a given that, yes, this is what you should expect from yourself, right? You, mm -hmm. on, a, on a bad day, you come silver at the Olympic Games and there's nobody else in climbing that has that expectation. So I can understand to a certain amount that like, yeah, she she's living on a different level of, of, of just like buzz um, when you have that kind of expectation. It's crazy. No, I'm sure there's nobody else on the scene right now that can relate to the expectations that she has. I think it's worth noting the interview that Yanya had with Alana at the end of the bouldering portion in which Alana said something to Yanya, something along the lines of, oh, you must have been disappointed with your silver medal earlier this season. And Yanya quickly quipped back. She said, oh, I wasn't I wasn't disappointed. And sh sure, I think maybe, OK, disappointment is not the right word. Maybe she wasn't disappointed, but I do think there had to be some question marks in Yanya's own head as a result of that silver medal question marks about, can I still perform at the level, the gold medal standard that I have set for myself. And so I think the fact that Yanya was able to answer that question, I, I think that was kind of packed into these, those tears that we saw at the end of the bouldering portion too. I, I think her crying and showing so much emotion, I think, you really can't say enough about that because I think that that was really significant. And I think a lot of what was woven into that was not just the injury coming back from the injury, not just coming back after being so intermittent last season and intermittent this season, but also just coming back from that silver medal to, to the gold medal, getting, getting up that, that highest rung. And maybe just thanking God that, oh, thank God I'm not as short that, as I, Maury. Maybe that was the, <laughs> the real relief from the <laughs> for that. No, so, we'll talk about that later. John, I wanted to ask you though, John, like, do you have, do you have a headline aside from Yanya or do you want to like, is yours related? Cause I, I think a lot of us are probably like Yanya centric today. My headline is related to all of this that we've been talking about. So we'll just go right into it. My headline was, so originally my headline was Yanya delivers her second best performance ever. And then I Ooh. scratched it off and I said, well, Yanya delivers her best performance maybe question mark right i i don't know second best or her best and let me let me explain yeah here. i want to hear the rationale here that's amazing well so i'm i'm not saying her most significant performance because i think of course sweeping the boulder seas winning the olympic gold is you know more significant in the long run 
sweeping the boulder season is more significant in 2019. But if you just isolate the singular performance to sweep that boulder season, she, she won in Vail, right? So she got to the, you know, she went through those four boulders, but I think what she did here performatively uh, exceeds that. If you think about flashing all four of the boulders and then going into the lead portion and climbing, uh, what was it, like six moves higher than than I, Mori? I, I think that that is a more stellar, uh, like I said, a more stellar p- performance in and of itself. I, I think the only one that would come close, that would rival this, would be the 2019 Hachioji World Championships, where she also, if we remember, I mean, we'll just kind of take the combined thing out of this because that was yes please <laughs> but please God. But i'm like racking my memory trying to like share <laughs> what was that root natchi og of like <laughs> right but she Man, i was i was there and i can't even remember yeah but but she did win the lead world championship and the boulder so she did the dual gold there at hachi og as well but if you were if you recall in the bouldering portion she had three tops one of which was a flash to win the bouldering uh, world championships in 2019 and then in the lead portion i think she was four moves higher than mia crample or something like that so again like the significance of a world championship is greater than the world cup but here with when she does the dual gold as well but it was founded upon four flashes in the finals and getting six moves higher than the next competitor six moves higher than i mori I think you can make a really compelling case that this was the the greatest kind of weekend performance that we've ever seen Yanya do. That's interesting, yeah. Yeah, I would I would just say that for me there's there's not much difference between a, a World Championships and a World Cup these days anyway. Um, you know, the, the title headline is is different, but realistically the comps look exactly the same. But that's possibly a point for another day that you've probably covered before. Um and I, but I think there is an element of of the, the 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 watching audience asked the people in the crowd just just praying that just towards Yanya like please still be good still be that good I'm not I want to be entertained I want you to be really really good I want you to push the standards higher than they already are I'm not ready for you to kind of bow out just yet um, so I think like we're we're pushing that pressure onto her as well I I think that's a really good point because I do think. Yanya's star power as is at an all time high as a result of the Olympics and just kind of she's just in the past I think year or two years she has become this mega star and I think she's brought in a lot of new eyes to the sport and it would be a real disappointment for those fans those new fans if this person that they've they've had hyped up so much it's like these people are finally tuning in to watch yanya yanya is finally on their radar and then they tune in and she's what past her prime or past her performative peak that would be a a real downer so it's it's kind of working out perfectly that she had this star power building to an apex and then more people are tuning in and they're still getting to see the version of yanya that, that's that, that's actually a really good point. That's and you know what that makes me think a lot about about uh, the the best example I have is actually just like Sean McCall for us in Canada because I really started paying to the World Cups just after he kind of peaked where he was getting like a medal a year, but you know it wasn't always that convincing and and everybody in Canada was just like hyping this guy like crazy and so when you're new when you're kind of like new to following the World Cups really really diligently you're like what's the what's the big deal like I'm what, I'm supposed to get excited for a bronze medal like what's going on here why why is this such a uh, such a hype moment but if you were around and you see you know Canada's first name that actually becomes a consistent finalist and is winning golds in like both disciplines. Yeah, I totally understand where the psych was, but I came a little bit too late to see that. And I could totally imagine, yeah, if if you came out, if you started watching climbing after the Olympics and everybody's telling you, yeah, Yanni's the greatest climber of all time. She like, she's pr- the best boulder of all time, according to some people. Yeah, these last couple seasons have left you wanting a lot more when you barely ever see her. So I think that's a really fair point. Yeah, I mean, look at uh, earlier this season. If you had tuned in because y- oh, Yanya's return, she's returning to the World Cup circuit, and then she gets a, a silver medal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're left with exactly. kind of like, oh, well, I mean, it was yeah, okay. She's she's a a podium placer, but mm-hmm. I'm not sure if I see the 
the legend, the goat, all these accolades that people, you know, throw upon her. I'm not sure if I see that in a silver medal performance. So for all those fans, this was this was a weekend performance for all those newer fans, maybe. And then all of us longtime fans felt satisfied as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's fair. Speaking of new people, um, my headline is going to have to be Serato and Raku for for such a mature debut season on the Boulder World Cup. And I mean, I won't even like mention that he had a really good lead performance as well this weekend. We'll just focus on the bouldering about winning his first World Cup gold medal. Some people do that in their first season. Like it's not crazy, but it was really good. Um, of course, he was consistent through much of the uh, much of the rest of the season. I think he only had one comp where he was outside of the top 10. Otherwise, he was always like within the top seven. And so he ends up walking away with the 2023 Boulder World Cup in his name. I think that makes him the youngest ever boulderer to win a season World Cup. Um, if it wasn't for Adam Andra's pesky like 2009 lead World Cup, I think he'd be the youngest across all disciplines. Um, but it was just like remarkable. And I think I think I'm a little bit bent because on the women's side of bouldering, it's not that impressive to have somebody come in in their first or second season and be this dominant force, right? Like Oriane Bertone went from being a rookie to being like old news in the course of three months in, in, that, <laughs> in that first season we saw her. We're like, why isn't she doing better? And she had done like, what, three World Cups in her entire career? And on the women's side, you just get used to that. You get used to young winners. You get used to dominance from young climbers. Whereas on the men's side, it is something that for the most part, these climbers have to mature and go through a few seasons before they get that that like ever precious first World Cup gold medal. And it might be the only gold medal they ever get, right? Like we know a bunch of these guys got one gold medal and they've been on the circuit for years, if not like close to a decade. And this guy gets his in his very first season and then wins the entire damn thing. And so I'm really having to force myself to remember like, wow, this is actually an exceptional performance from this kid. And especially in a season where a lot of the other narrative for Japanese athletes was, this is like, you know, Miho's having a good season still. That's awesome to see. Futaba's not maturing the way a lot of people kind of had expectations for her to. And then on the men's side, like Kokoro Fuji goes absolutely AWOL. Yoshiyuki took quite a long time to ramp up this year to become like anywhere close to what his previous performance was. And that said, he probably really underperformed to his own expectations. And then Tomoa, thank God, was like holding on there as a, as a somewhat regular finalist. But man, the Japanese drop off from last year when they swept the entire season, like it was, it was a really big change for the Japanese team. And it was people like Serato, him specifically, that carried that. And I should mention uh, uh, Climbers JP, that, that climbing blog out of Japan, mentioned that I, I hadn't seen this, so this was new to me. So this was the ninth straight season where the Japanese team won the bouldering ranking for like a country so since 2014 it's been japan on top the entire way and that mm. medal this year is owed to serato and raku the new kid um so what a what a stunner like great season from this guy i think it's so uh, like interesting from the other team's perspective as well with the japanese team like you're saying with that little bit of a drop off of the last few calms few seasons and maybe a lot of the other teams think oh man at last we've, it's our know, chance we've got us we've got a slight opportunity and around comes the next corner like some 16 year old who just like flashes boulders that nobody else is touching yeah and just once again it's like oh okay they've, they've got a lot in the, <laughs> the the b team still pretty handy yeah yeah absolutely it the Japanese team has put together a pretty incredible legacy right up there with maybe the French team of the of the late 80s early 1990s it, I, it's hard to, it, when you think of iconic squads that ruled the circuit for multiple years like that nine years at the top for team Japan and the, that's got to be the the most hefty in the entire history of the bouldering discipline I would think it could uh, be yeah and uh, it, with Serato specifically, it was pretty remarkable because this whole season I was expecting that dip that we've seen. Tyler, you mentioned Orion, which we saw in years past. I think this year proved maybe she's kind of beyond that a little bit. But where, okay, they, the young, the youngster, the young competitor starts off really strong. And then just because it is a long season, because there's added pressure, just because of inexperience, youthful all of that stuff plays into it you a lot of times do see a dip 
And we saw that in the past, maybe with like Oceana McKenzie two years ago when she had that really stellar breakout performance and then didn't do much for the rest of the season. So I was just expecting, okay, at some point, uh, Serato will kind of do that inevitable drop in the in the standings, and then presumably he'll come back next year and and we'll see him again perform really well. Maybe there will be a drop again, and then some at some point he'll kind of mature and get the hang of things in terms of the long season. He surprised me. I he, I was shocked that he was able to stay consistent like that for the entire Boulder season. 16 years old, uh, that's pretty remarkable, especially, as you said, Tyler, considering the depth on the Japanese team and the, the older competitors on Team Japan. The fact that Serato was able to repeatedly rise above all of them, uh, if, <laughs> really incredible. Really and this incredible. was, like, like Mike mentioned, like this was a great finals round to kind of like showcase where this kid was at right we saw some strength and we saw some weakness i actually thought that you know the two middle men's boulders were were kind of like a fun like a, a side by side like a b test of of how the climbers handled different things i thought it was really cool um but yeah the the flash on on number two in particular if i'm remembering that mm-hmm. that ordering right that was like oh damn man this is uh this is a good time so yeah that was i gotta shout him out as uh, as my winner just because uh, i think it will fly under the radar the Yanya story is going to be big. The I Mori and the root setting story is going to be big. But but we got to mention like winning a World Cup season is a big deal. As much as I'm going to like downplay Natalia's three in a row, and like you know in just a few minutes. But you know aside from that, it is a it is a big deal. Mike's gone little head, but we can still hear him. So we just this is just how we rock and yeah, roll. Still, don't don't worry I'm about still, it. You're, you're still there. You'll come back. Yeah. Um, I'm sort of like w- <laughs> creeping back in. Maybe I'm just not. I'm not uh, injecting enough talented conversation here. No, you're right. It's, um, it's, this is how we this is how we cane people off the stage, right? We just shrink you down yeah. until the, yeah. Um, I was well, just gonna just gonna add into the Serato stuff. His flash on um, it was men's one. He flashed and he just completely parfed it. And you think, okay, this is going to be one of those easier boulders, but um, you know, it didn't turn out quite to be that way. And then his top on men's two was was really impressive to see how the other guys really struggled that sort of hard campus of the big circular volume outright the the sort of like the blocked volume yeah um with a really hard last move that was genuinely looked like a you know a properly hard boulder and then um on number four to come out and finish the round off with such an impressive top on boulder four as well as just like okay this you know this wasn't it's not just a flash in the pan this guy he's actually got he's got the whole package and i think it was um one comment i heard on the commentary of the weekend was they call him like sticky sticky or something i kept he hearing that over and over <laughs> yeah i think uh, they're referring to you know you, you see a lot of climbers especially beginners they grab a hold and they like fiddle around with it and they, they don't just settle on a hold he grabs the hold he sticks to it and he doesn't adjust it and i think that's what they were referring to uh... calling him sticky yeah, that's a new one on me, but I kind of, uh, I kind of appreciate it. Um, <laughs> he, but he also climbs with such confidence. He just, you know, he knows what he's doing. He, if he, he thinks he's going to grab it there, he goes, grabs it there, and carries on. There you go. Yeah, that that was one of the few comments that like didn't make sense to me. I'm like, I don't like that's It's such an odd comment that I feel like you should know what you're talking about and understand like why they've given him that nickname before you start calling somebody sticky because it's just kind of like it's a bit of like a bit of an ick kind of feeling. Like I don't want to yeah. be described as sticky, um, but whatever, whatever, man. It's all good. Yeah. It, it felt uh, a bit like I I was the the kid in school who who hadn't seen the movie or the TV show that everybody else had said because on commentary they kept saying that everyone calls him sticky and i was i was like really i everyone i i've never i've never That's heard you need one of those it. big like citation needed stickers just slap that on that comment i'm like who who are you talking about and why yeah it felt it felt very left out from that uh, that conversation that's a good yeah. I think what was what was good about that final though was the fact that it was a good round of boulders in my opinion. It was there was no major controversy like we had the, the day before, um, and it, he he won in a style of, of a round of boulders where it was just you know a, an opportunity for, for 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 everybody to take it away, uh, and, and and he performed the best at the end of the day. Uh, well, let's, no let's actually just in a round. let's segue straight into our winners because I know Mike, you were talking about possibly mentioning some of the men's root setting as a winner itself. So let's just go right into that. 
Well, yeah, I mean, the YouTube comments uh, for the IFSC streams is always a, a dangerous place to hang out. But it was so interesting looking at the, you know, the hundreds of comments about the women's competition, which I'm sure we'll get onto. But and then the men's competition was just the straight, straight opposite. And everyone absolutely killing the root setters about the women's competition. And then it's the same team who are getting all the praise on the next set of comments. And it's just like, oh, man, like, who would want to be a root setter at this level? It's just yeah. insane what they have to, to go through. Just obviously, like, putting to one side the actual difficulty of the job, but just to mentally survive, your ego has to get just shredded every time you, you, you go to a competition. But they did say that, um, men's number three, and I agree um, with with a lot of those guys in the comments. Men's number three, the slab, um, had this super cool rotational 180 spin move. Um, uh, you know, I'm a, a connoisseur of, of good climbing and good route setting, and for me, that was that was one of the best moves I've seen for a while. And in, in, in competition route setting, I tend to 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 not enjoy watching the slab boulders. For me, they they tend to be a bit too slow and um, if I'm a chief of a competition, I always say like for the for the slab, if it's a three or four ball around, we really don't want it to be a snail fest and kind of just really slow and the crowd can't really engage with it. They can't see any of the holes. It's all just, you know, it's kind of not interesting to watch. And, you know, we're always talking about the show, but the the, the men's free slab, the, the way that um, the root set has set it, um, just trying to remember the chap's name on the co-commentary. Um, oh, it's Cody uh, Grodsky. Yeah. Cody, yeah. Um, his insight at that moment was was just perfect watching the athletes and he was like you know you gotta you gotta twist in and spin 180 drop the drop the left shoulder and round you go and you know you're watching it you're thinking like really like are they ever going to read this is this going to be one of those things that the root setters have come up with that just nobody's going to do and that they will never really just crimp the back of the volume and find their other way like another way around it but as soon as serato like he went out he dropped that shoulder and uh, started spinning as it Sam Avazu's rotation, just like the camera work on his face. And the, he was almost like the, the positions that the climbers got themselves in was like, that is a true respect moment for coming up with such a move. And for the athletes to actually do it in the main part, in the way that the root setters wanted, it's like, okay, that, that is a big win. Like that was a, that was a really cool boulder that wasn't related around sort of sliding across six volumes and sort of shredding yourself into a corner. It was just some, some proper old school technical wizardry mixed through like root reading um and and almost a new move i think and and instantly this morning i've seen you know i've obviously followed various climbing walls and stuff around the around the world and i've seen roots that is already like setting that this morning like mm. they're on the case and you, and you know that that's a big deal we've seen um the jump out of the corner from one of the previous events to the double yeah. palm downs this year like kind of new move territory and this one again was like okay that, that is a really really cool move and um, so it's so a great work after getting absolutely hammered the day before for the root setters to uh, yeah stick to what they're good at and, and produce something truly awesome it is kind of interesting that the season started with this very ambitious move in hachioji that jump up kind of like i, I guess mantle's nothing but kind of jumping up into like an iron cross or whatever mm. um that we saw mejdi obviously working after the comp and that was kind of a hype moment and then this move as well which i guess if i if i this was kind of one of the moves that was the focus of that flat hold video from earlier this season where they were kind of like projecting movements that they had tried in the past but hadn't That's worked it. out and so this was that it was kind of like vindication of this process from the Meringen setters from last year or the year before that whenever it was they set it and then you know working it really like trying to dial the mechanics and now actually getting it out there and that's just like it kind of just it reflects the the um, uh, the community process of root setting where, you know, you can have somebody on one side of the pond have this goal and work this um, work this concept. And, you know, they're the person that puts it on Instagram and everybody's like, that's not forced, that's not forced, right? And then you get the, the entire planet of root setters just you know you get the experimental guys are like yeah i want to try that can i force this let's see what i can do and and you get this iterative process through the entire global community and then it ends up actually becoming a thing i thought it was uh really cool and the same comment i made about the lead final where you had the ambitious goal of both routes ending on the same like hold, right? I basically think to myself in route setting, if you try anything cool, you're destined to fail, right? If you try to show off a little too much, it's just fate's not going to work out that way. But in this moment, it really did. Uh, and it was the the kind of perfect, you know, uh, it was the magic of the moment. It was great setting the right athletes somehow 
when you look at that roster of guys in that men's final, you're like, this is not the crew of people that you want to put ambitious, like avant-garde moves in because like three of these guys are unproven as finalists. Why would you do it in this field? Um, but yeah. yeah it and it great. wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't just that move either with a lot of sort of paddle dinos or, you know, like whatever you want to call them, you know, you know, yeah, like flying across the wall with a big show. It's, a lot of the time it tends to be over after that move or there's there's little drama from that point onwards um just the way that the the move to the zone obviously the zone was really was the pretty much the last the last move essentially yes, it, was, yeah. it was the whole before last um it, you know that's that's usually not a good sign for a boulder but that, that's what they to make that boulder work that's what they had to do mm-hmm. um and, and they stuck with it that's really risky but there was drama around getting the zone as well and um Mechie's, like top right at the, the last second as well was was really good drama so the the boulder had everything it had the move it had uh, the athletes performing on the moves and it had the drama um, to go alongside it um and that's the sort of moments that i think they they stay with root setters and diehard fans i think they remember those things um, and w- yeah, I, I know here that the root setters next week will be, will be trying to create something similar. There was something pretty serendipitous about that boulder, not just the moves, which we've mentioned that that great, you know, the kind of facing the crowd 180 that, that the competitors had to do uh, the, the, I mean, great hold the kilter holds that it was on, but also the story that was allowed to unfold because of that boulder because Serato comes out first and if I remember correctly if he tops it he wins and and so so essentially the the fourth boulder at least in terms of determining the gold medal would have been kind of worthless at that point not that we would have necessarily looked upon his victory that less or anything. Yeah, I don't. But it... I don't think that call was right. I think that was too soon to make that call that Cody did because we were basically like there were two boulders left, and he was only down, or everybody else was only behind him by two boulders at most. I think that was preemptive. Um, well, only by the, a little bit, but I think. Yeah, so. but the point is, the fact that Serato did not top that boulder yeah. allowed the drama to continue on to the last boulder, which Tyler, we've said time and time again, we like it when it comes down to the last boulder. You know, the competitor has to, we mm-hmm. want him to top this boulder in, or, in order to win and whatnot. Uh, it was a little tricky with Serato because he came out first. So you kind of, throughout all the boulders, you had to wait to see how everybody else did mm-hmm. after him. But uh, yeah, it was just great. It just all, like I said, serendipitous that he didn't end up topping that third boulder. And we were allowed to continue with the intrigue and the tension into the, the next boulder. It was great. It was a great bouldering round. Yeah, my, my last shout out, uh, just because you were talking about the YouTube comments, and we'll, I know we're going to talk more about root setting in the losers section for sure, but I, I couldn't help but laugh the people in the comments that thought the root setters were t- so dumb that they couldn't set a proper height dino and at the same time they were such masterminds that they had tweaked the round to specifically amplify yanya's chances of winning i'm like you got to pick one they're either trash root setters or they're you know like geniuses that are, are trying to throw the entire competition i thought that was really funny so shout out to those commenters you guys are keep keep typing keep typing keep throwing on that caps lock that's that's what i want to see when i wake up let's go um, do you want to do you want to address that comment that people were saying oh this was unfair to i maury she couldn't reach that jump do you, should we chip away at that let's now, do or? it in, let's do it in losers yeah okay. let's because because i think that's where it because you know whether it's uh-huh. the root setters or the people commenting somebody's a loser for sure in there and if not it's just i maury i guess and you might have to cope with that too who who knows uh john what uh, tell me about your winner what's your what's your pick yeah i th- think that my winner would be sasha layman who admittedly let's just be honest kind of his victory in men's lead kind of got overshadowed by uh, Serato in in a way being the young standout and then also I think everybody was overshadowed by Yanya's incredible double gold but I do think that Sasha Lehman deserves some credit first of all the men's lead final was was really exciting right M- Magos comes out and sets this high point and then you, I mean it was a little bit of a bottleneck there in the middle but you kind of every competitor that comes out you're like okay this guy will probably get past the crux and this guy will probably get past the crux and then nobody does it until Sasha comes out added drama because he didn't rest for as long on that that knee bar which they the commentary they were kind of saying like oh in order to to get to Magos's high point 
the competitors, someone's probably going to have to rest on that knee bar for a long time, like Magos did. And then, so when Sasha didn't really rest that long, you're kind of like, oh, he's, you know, he's set himself up for failure. He's going to pump out and not going to, he's not going to get past the crux either. He ended up getting past that bottleneck where everybody else got and, and matching Magos' high point and winning on countback. But mm-hmm. I think in the larger context, it was great because Sasha Lehman kind of works himself back into some major relevance here, right? I, he, If you remember, like last year, I think he was on a podium. He almost won gold, but he didn't. I think in 2021, he was on a podium, but didn't get a gold. You you have to go all the way back to pre-pandemic 2019 when Sasha Lehman won a gold medal. And the fact that then he didn't qualify for the Olympics, I think we, I don't know, you just kind of, it's like, easy, it was easy to forget about him, especially because we had so many other crushers in the men's division. This was a great uh, way for Sasha to kind of stamp his, to put his foot in the ground and say, I'm still, I'm still here. I'm still a real viable force for this for this men's lead division. I'm looking forward to seeing what happens in the next lead World Cups. That, that's the kind of Briançon, Villars, Chamonix back-to-back. You know, can he back it up with, with, with another result or is it just another, you know, another win that was in a, in a slightly odd stack of results in the, mm. in the, the final? And the, the, the final route in the men's was, I actually found it kind of really interesting. And some people, again, was obviously everything's the route set's fault. Everyone fell off within the first, you know, the same bunch of moves, but it's, you know, in my opinion, it's not really got anything to do with the route setting. It looked like a very consistent route. Obviously, there was a rest, and then it was um, like a power endurance route from that point onwards. It was also brutally hard. Um, but for everybody to fall off, well, not everybody, but a whole bunch of guys around that 44, uh, 44 plus, for that to happen is it, is, it shows that how tight the level is amongst all of those guys. You know, Megos, Schubert, Ines Lopez, Sasha, the those are kind of like a bunch of old school guys who have been competing. Uh, old school, they're probably not even twenty five. <laughs> uh, you know, they, they, um, you know, it, it was really cool to see to see a route that, that that pushed them to that that level. But they all are just so so close in their ability, and I, I don't think anybody could have predicted it from the route setting side. That oh yeah, there's just this really hard move at forty four plus. Like we all know, it's going to be a bit risky. It just wasn't like that. It was just just pure power endurance and they all just run out of steam exactly at the same point. I, I think I just, to your, to your point, like having, having Serato who's 16, having Jakob who's 32, right? So we got like double the age right there. And then all the guys in between born through the nineties and the early two thousands mm. and stuff. I thought it was like a, an ex, a very interesting field having all of these different people. So many of them who have won uh, gold medals in lead climbing Uh and then, and then for the results to be that tight, right? And I think it really, I think it's a good, uh, you know, a lot of stuff from this comp is a really good heads up for the root setters for the rest of the season of like, hey, here's a reminder. I'm is short. Here's a reminder that the men are all really freaking strong. So you're going to have to work extra hard to separate these guys. So I thought it was a good, uh, a good kind of like start to like set a, it kind of set the table for, for what we should expect for the rest of the year. I got to contrast with, John, though, for me as a spectator, and again, like we all have different things that we enjoy when we watch climbing. I, I was, I kind of wish that there was a bit of a fast forward button on the men's side. It did get to a point where it was like, I don't necessarily have to watch this for the first 30 moves of this climb. It felt so stable through all of them, including through those dynamic moves. None of them felt like they were actually adding much risk to the climbing, at least for men at that level. It felt like it was kind of a given that we were going to get them up into those volumes where a lot of the falling started to happen. So I was a little bit disappointed there, um, but I, I won't argue with it if we talk about Sasha himself. Um, again, in, in men's climbing, winning one gold medal is great, and now he's got two. And I think uh, he was he was one of those fun guys that kind of uh, showed up for the first time in 2019. It was the first year that we were doing this debrief. So like him and Alberto have this special this special place in my in my heart because that was the first season where we started doing this podcast. And uh, I'm really happy just from an emotional level that he did so well. So, uh, yeah, I thought it was a big win for him. And hopefully going into a Swiss World Cup in Villar, hopefully he can get that win at home like he did back in 2019. Yeah, I was there. It was good. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Was yeah. that the foggy just, one or was that years later? I can't remember. No, which. that was that was the hot one. I got oh, okay, heat stroke gotcha. just before the speed. <laughs> I got heat stroke just before the speed finals. Oh no! And uh, 
you know, I, I had to help put the cameras up because nobody else was there. And I was, I was trying to make notes for the speed final. The speed final comes around and got a really bad heat stroke. I was just downing like cold Coca-Cola to try and survive the one hour live stream for the speed finals. And then got absolutely hounded on the internet and through actually uh, some uh, IFSC athletes who should be no named at this point <laughs> um, for, for not having appropriate notes for the speed final, even though I was completely on my ass for the entire yeah. thing. I was lucky, lucky to even get a word out. Wow. Uh, anyway. Anyway, you 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 were, were you were chugging Coca Cola like a carbonated beverage before you did a broadcast. I I, I was literally like I I need to go to hospital. I'm dying. Right. <laughs> no, like, I'm just can, thinking like you must have been belching survive. through the entire competition. Like I would have been I would have been burping nonstop, just like constantly having to keep that away from the mic. Especially the speed that you have to talk during a speed final, anyway. Sure, that's yeah. a different story. <laughs> Knocking off all all of those like Eastern European names that you're struggling right. with. It's like, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I just wanted to go back to your point there, Tyler, about um, the um, the show of the lead competitions. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think we could do a whole podcast about why there's 26 athletes in the lead semi final and it goes on for hours and it's really dry. Sure, yeah. But the final itself, for me, eight eight climbers still doesn't really make much sense. Um, and I just I mean, can it can the show be improved anymore? Like, what what could we do to make it more interesting? That's a, it's a fairly hefty subject, but you know, I did watch it with a fast forward button, and and you can ah, see that's the that's the crux right there. <laughs> watching YouTube replays in fast forward doesn't give you anywhere near the drama. It just gives you the result. Um, and it's it's definitely not the same. That's an experience I've had to put up with, with the last few seasons, uh, being really busy with family life at home, and you do just hit your way through it. And when you do get to watch it live, it, there is like the the, the the space to to process your thoughts of the what ifs, like oh what if what if Stasha does this next, and you know you, when you're just hitting plus ten seconds every every few minutes to get through to the good stuff, you you do miss that. Um, but lead climbing is. It's fairly dry. See, that's funny because at, on the whole, I, I disagree on that point. And it was really just this competition for the men's side that got me like I I am happy to say that lead finals is my favorite final. Um, I think it it's when the climbers come out, there's really no downtime. They're on the wall and there can be tension from the bottom to the top. There's only that one shot. And I feel like none of us do a great job of explaining what it is that creates the magic for us personally to watch something. But lead climbing has a magic for me where on, on a typical lead route, I can have enough enough nerves for that climber and enough hope for them to do better than the person before them that it keeps me engaged and I really like it. But for this particular men's round, it just felt like such a given in my head where I was like, oh, there's not really anything to get tense about. Like for the women's side, it was great. I enjoyed it, even though women's kind of suffered from a similar bottleneck issue that the men's did. There were enough falls low down and there was enough actual struggle and it was a little more uncertain through some of those sequences getting up towards the top. We saw a lot of different beta from different climbers that kept it pretty hot. Uh, the women's one kept me. The men's one did not. So I'm I'm actually like pretty pro lead climbing in terms of that aspect of it. Um, but just for the men's one in particular, it was uh, I, this one was a bit of a snoozer for me just for the men's. But yeah. Yeah, the uh, fact that Helene Janico fell at what was her score like se seven plus or something? She fell yeah, at the like second, second draw, right yeah. above the second clip. Uh, so, f from seven moves for the rest of the women's route, you're kind of holding your breath. Yeah, we didn't really get that in the men's division, but I think the, the if there's a silver lining to this, the fact that there were a lot of bottlenecks in the women's a fair amount, and then there were a lot of bottlenecks in the men, it does kind of set up some intrigue for the next comps because i don't know if we really had a clear picture of of how the men like who's performatively better than the others i mean you could make the argument that and i think people did online that it was kind of like in the women's yanya was clearly the best and then i was a little below her and then there were kind of the other women I think, yeah, you're fair to say because there's so much left over from last season. I think, yeah, everybody was here for the Yanya I duel, right? Like that was the right. story and everybody else was like, well, we'll see what happens. But yeah. Right. But you're you're looking at, for instance, let's look at the men here. You're, you're saying is, you know, is Sasha that much better than Jakob? Or, or, well, let's say is Jakob that much better than Serato at lead? Is Jakob that much better than Mejdi? Is sure. 
Sato- it's like you don't really know because of that bottleneck. And so I think I do think that that creates some intrigue for gosh, we have to continue watching this lead season because it, 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 all these men seem pretty close together right now. Uh, I, the, and the one thing I wanted to, to add to that is two names that didn't even get to finals, Luca Potichar, your champion from 2022, and Jesse Gruper, who came third place in the overall season last year. To not have them in finals, to me, was a, a bummer because I like watching them climb, but it made you realize, like, oh, shit, like, this is a... And again, semifinals kind of suffered from similar stuff, right? A little bit, a little bit cruxy, um, but... It, it makes you kind of realize, like, damn, this is a strong field. It's not like the days where we just had, like, you know, two Spaniards and an Austrian, and that's going to be your podium, like, every comp for two years, right? This is, this is like, a hefty, uh, a hefty field, um, including young names like Serato, who managed to stay relevant, at least in this comp, and it was first lead event. Mejdi, who also stayed relevant. I, I, Mejdi was kind of a question mark for me for his lead season. I was wondering if, if he was going to do, like, a super strong boulder and a super strong lead in the same year and it looks like he might be able to so yeah it's gonna be packed getting into lead finals is gonna be brutal man i'm i'm excited it keeps it just as tense as the bouldering was that's to say nothing of colin duffy who was a standout last year at innsbruck and Mm -hmm. didn't didn't even make the finals this year and i so i I still kind of feel like maybe this i was mentally prepped for that one just because he hasn't really shown up in the in the in the boulder either so i was i was kind of like i don't know if it's collins year but fair fair point yeah um i want to talk about my my winner and it's really just to you know shout out actually you know what just to change it up my winner is that they bothered to actually show the season trophy presentation on the live stream which they didn't do last year so i'm really glad that we got to recognize the climbers who did the best over the entire season it is a historic prize that seems to matter less and less and less as the olympics becomes a more important thing and attending all the world cups doesn't matter as much to people Um, but it was great to see that they actually showed it because it means a lot to the climbers, I think. And it means a lot to people just interested in history and, and things like that. And so my actual winner is Natalia Grossman. That's her third Boulder World Cup win in a row. And when I say the World Cup, I mean the entire year, the whole the whole circuit. Um, actually, a really steady, steady podium, like the the Yanya, or sorry, the Natalia Miho Brook podiums, the exact same one from last year. Um, and so I, I just want to shout out the fact that that's his consistent high level climbing from Natalia and those two other women. You can kind of throw Oriane in there as well because she had a lot of absences. Uh, she was also a very high level performer. So I think we're we're kind of reaching a, a period where we've got this very consistent set of, of female climbers like we have in the past. It's not one of those years in flux like we had in 2019 and maybe what we thought we might be experiencing in 2021. No, we've got this like solidified squad of people where you can be an incredible fan of women's bouldering and you can expect to see your favorite climber in every World Cup. And that is incredible mm. for viewership and storytelling. So a huge win for Natalia, who I guess the actual angle is her season started like crap. And she managed to bring it back and overcome health struggles and 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 end it on a really big high point. Not a win for the event, but a win for the season. And uh, I'm sure she's really proud of that. She should be. Congratulations. I think you're right. I think the overall used to be that did used to be kind of like a very very big deal. Yeah. And obviously, I still yeah, rate it as bigger like... than the world championship. Like it's a way more impressive achievement than winning a world champion. Like you said, Mike, it's like the world championship functionally not that different from a world cup. Mm. I think we could get onto the watering down of too many events another day, maybe. Um, just one more winner, if that's okay, which was, I, me- I mentioned it earlier, was um, Innsbruck saying that they uh, climbing's coming home to Innsbruck and, uh, you know, maybe that offended quite a few countries. But uh, the, the actual organisers did seem to, to, to nail this one. They do know how to put on a good show. Um, I thought the, the ambient sound and everything on the live stream really helped to bring the the event to life for viewers at home um you know the shots of the crowd clearly enjoying themselves in, in the big moments and uh, a lot of head in hands and kind of screaming and uh you know the light show the walls everything there just it it looks good i always used to love it when it was in the town square obviously they've moved away from that in innsbruck to do it at the, uh, uh, the climbing center now um it had the opportunity to be not as good but this one i think yeah it, it's not as you guys know, it's not easy organizing an event back to back like that, Boulder lead. Um, I thought they nailed it. 
it was it was really good to see. Um, I love I love going to Innsbruck, and it's good to see things going well. You know, obviously, they had that kind of rained off boulder round from was it last year, year before, um, and to, to to come and to nail a good event is is always good for climbing. It's good for viewership. I, I won't debate the good event thing, but I, I want to throw in the context and, and ask you just because I've, I've asked a couple other people for this context. Um, so Stasia posted on, on Instagram kind of talking about her journey from the last couple comps. But she mentioned that when she got to Innsbruck, she felt very unwelcome. She didn't enjoy the atmosphere. She she felt like people were were I, I'm just going to this. These are my own words, not hers, but kind of like there was a bit of like a stick up your butt vibe from a lot of people involved in organizing the competition. So I reached out to like a couple people who have been around the scene for a bit. And a lot of them just kind of mentioned that that might just be an Austrian thing. Like maybe that's kind of a well-worn stereotype <laughs> that they're very, you know, rigid with the rules and, uh, you know, no, no, uh, no lax bending of, of how the system is supposed to work. Um, so I wasn't sure if it was the, you know, the facility specifically or the Federation specifically. It sounds like it might be a bit of an Austrian thing, but I thought it was an interesting contrast to, um, to, to using the phrase climbing, you know, comes home when you've got a little bit of dissent being like, ugh, I hate having to come back here from some of these yeah. athletes who corroborated that same sentiment in the comments. I don't know if you, if you've ever felt the same thing. I'm not worldly enough to comment on like stereotypes of different countries' personalities, but well, I'm curious well, if you have what I would say. say is, um, yeah, I have I have been to that event a few times, and well, uh, one time I turned up with an umbrella and a dog, and I crossed the the road to get there with without waiting for the green flashing light for allowing me to cross, and that was three absolute sins in Innsbruck. It turned out, and uh, I didn't feel particularly welcome. Yeah, you're not allowed umbrellas when it's raining. You're not allowed to bring a dog in, even though there was nobody there, and you can't cross the road until you absolutely must cross the road altogether otherwise you're a child murderer and um i, I like to live live a uh, slightly more liberal existence than that and um yeah i can see where stash is coming from on occasions but they do know how to build a, a really good looking climbing wall with some nice pretty lights so you know it swings around it's a about. wash yeah <laughs> <laughs> Uh, John, what did I was you... trying to I was trying to pull up Stasha's Instagram. I was going to read the post, but I can't pull it up on my computer here because yeah, I guess I'm fine. not logged into my Instagram. But uh, yeah. anyway, I, I just wanted to add, I think an obvious thing that helped the organization uh, and just helped the comp seem really great was the fact that we finally had so many stars at this at one event. It's actually a decent the, field. Yeah. To wrap up the, the season. Yeah the big crux this whole season is we've had these it, it, like we've said the phrase we've said here one week gone the next right and so it's been everything's been taken with a grain of salt it's like yeah yanya's here but natalia's not here or yeah natalia's here but brooke's not here or yeah you know it's like it, it almost just seemed to a t like every event was missing some big name now granted orion bertone was not here and i i suppose that th that could be a big downer because you, you got to think she presumably would have really put some pressure on on Yanya and Natalia and, and Miho and all Which the others. a crowd but, favorite too, yeah. And a crowd favorite, but nonetheless, I mean, this just in the Boulder, the women's field alone, the finalists, Yanya, Natalia, Miho, Brooke, Ayamori, Futaba Ito, I mean, that is, that's kind of like a who's who at the very top of the Boulder division, uh, at least in terms of superstars these days. So and the legendary was... Belgian men's bouldering team as well. Finally, you know, another, <laughs> another big, not to roast anybody, but like the, your point falls apart for the men's side for finals. Like what a, what a whack, what a whack finals this cool. Having like Sam Avazu, like descendant of greatness, right? Like, I don't know if that came up in the, in the live stream, but you know, one of those kids who has, you know, a, a climbing great, you know, a world cup, medalist winner um and his mom um but yeah my i, I the question i really wanted to pose about this because i'm really glad you brought it up mike because i don't think either of us would have but like is it what does it mean to say you're the home of climbing and is it fair that innsbruck gets that accolade like i don't i don't mind people you know using a little bit of hyperbole to promote their event like i'm fine with that i can i can understand it but there's got to be some other better candidates right i don't know how did you guys did you feel like there was a little bit of hubris it, it, it rubbed me slightly the wrong way, to be honest. But I don't know what it, what we what you would put as the home of climbing. But for me, climbing is a community event that's already been um, very international. Everyone's got different strengths from different countries. You know, rock climbing was the basis of it all. And you can't say like 
these are God's own rocks over here in Austria, you know, they, you know, everyone's got their own thing going on. Um, but yeah, whatever, it sounds like they've got a new marketing person to me. Well, John, what about you? I was kind of thinking if you want to use that phrase, the, the, the climbing comes home as a like marketing sizzle, wouldn't the, the opportunity to do that would be to hold a world cup in, where was the first 1989 Leeds? I think was where the first one was, right? And so, <laughs> so what are you saying? It should like be in England, do, right? the, the building's just demolished, like doesn't hold, even exist hold anymore. It in, yeah. Well, hold it in in Leeds again <laughs> on like whatever the 30th, 40th, what you know, whenever you want to pick the anniversary year. Uh, right. That would kind of be a little closer to climbing comes home because that's the the original home of the world of the the official world. Yeah, Cup the number circuit. the number of stops from that first year that like aren't just simply out of play. Like we're not going to Yalta, like right. Like there's a lot of there's a lot of places we're going to be skipping if we just go by like who was around first. I, but just I just to just you... to mention like places like Chamonix have been like far more consistent yeah. on the on the circuit. Briançon or just like I don't, I don't even know what you call that like the Haute Alp or whatever, but like the the French. I don't even know if that's the French Alps, but like the south of France where you get all the mountains and Briançon and Gap and and uh, all mm -hmm. those places. So I guess like broadly, yeah, I think the Alps in general is fair to say is like kind of the home of competitive climbing. But I thought it was a little I thought it was a little forward for uh, for a country that's only hosted two world championships compared to uh, or sorry, a, a city that's hosted two world championships compared to Paris having hosted, you know, three. So I don't know. Maybe it's maybe it's somewhere in France might be my like bent if I were to pick the home of, uh, of competitive climbing. But well, or even like Arco somewhere like that. Where you have Arco or Bardonecchia or something like that. Yeah, yeah, totally. Like there's there's some better choices. Yeah, I don't know. But, yeah, you know, that, it's that there. Be... It's I'm OK. Like John said, the word sizzle, that's a great word for it. I think, you know, we can all market it however you want. But uh, but yeah, well, yeah, the uh, the, the <laughs> slogan underneath the live stream was not climbing comes home. It was uh, when one door closes, another door opens, meaning that was freaking weird. I didn't like of, that at all. That was the end of the uh, the end of the Boulder season, the the start of the lead season. Um yeah, in the in the case of in the case of Yanya, it's the same door, right? She's just. <laughs> it's, uh, she's I, I, it. I that felt like it was like an English idiom that maybe got misinterpreted by somebody that's not like a you know a native speaker of the language because that that to me that's not that kind of phrase that I want to use around competitive sports. Like that's to me that means you're in a desperate position in life and God saves your ass by opening some door for sweet grace to to get out of whatever <laughs> terrible position you're in. Like I don't associate that with. Uh, with this kind of event it was a weird one but i want to see the next events like boulderings coming home they just everyone starts using it but in their own <laughs> speed climbing's coming home this yeah, weekend yeah yeah, yeah. no 100 mm. percent. it'll be it'll be like jakarta or something claiming that speed climbing's coming home and just everybody yeah. in russia is just throwing a vodka bottle at the tv <laughs> like how dare you 180 <laughs> degree slab climbing is moves are coming home <laughs> yeah exactly that's that'll be Meringen's slogan when they uh when they uh, have it yeah okay so let's talk about losers and then uh we can head towards wrapping this up um i try to think mike i've had mike be going first every single time john what's your what's your loser let's shake up the the sequence a little bit there were a couple p so i after the bouldering portion, I was, I was thinking I Mori could be talked about as the loser, but I, I've mentioned her before as a as the loser, be, and and I think I would select her here for the same exact reasons. Her just her struggles with the dynamic movement. I think on commentary, Alana Yip even said something like, "Oh, she's she's got to go do some box jumps or something, right?" I, and I think that that's all. So I won't list I Mori this time because it's kind of the same criticism as previous World Cups this season. I was also thinking Simon Lorenzi because he really it peaked just a, <laughs> just a few hours too soon. He peaked in the semifinals uh, where he just romped through all the boulders yeah. and then he got shut down in the finals. That was an impressive semifinal, man. Like, I can't take that away from him. That was just like it getting was. all four, like, yeah, un unreal. Like, really, really screwed himself in terms of expectations going into that final. But, like, great job to him. Yeah, I think, though, I'll probably land on ha Hannah Moyle because oh. – and, and this is not necessarily isolated to this – Boulder World Cup. It's more of a look at the whole season. She didn't do great this 
this World Cup in Innsbruck. I think she was 29th, something like that. Uh, she started off the season really strong. I think she was a second place in Hachioji. Mm, she was not at Salt. She was not at Salt Lake City, and I don't think she was at Prague either. I, I know she indicated on Instagram that she had some health issues. I think she was sick for a number of weeks or something like that. I don't know the details of that, but what I do know is, if you think back to last season when she was really vying for that top spot against Natalia, specifically at Innsbruck and at Brixen. And she ended up, Hannah Moyle ended up getting second place at those. But I think we were really thinking, okay, she is going to be, she got second place a couple times this year, meaning, you know, when we were talking last season, next year, 2023 is going to be her year of being just an absolute crusher, an absolute rock star, battling against Natalia, maybe giving Yanya a run for her money. We did not see that this year. She kind of just got lost in the shuffle had some events where she was like almost making finals, but not quite. Uh, so I, I guess we just kind of have to put a placeholder on her name. She didn't have the breakout, the, the kind of rock star season here that we, sh we thought she would. She still might, maybe it'll be next year. Maybe 2024 will be the year that we expected 2023 to be for Hannah Moyle. And that'd be really awesome to see if it happens. But as a, as a Boulder season on the whole, yeah, I was just kind of surprised uh, at Hannah Moyle this season, surprised that we didn't see her on more podiums. Maybe some of that was because she was sick. I'm not sure. Yeah, but, I think that's uh, I think that's a good choice. Like uh, like you said, like she was really, or it might have just been us, but we really set her up to be somebody to look out for this year. And aside from the fact that Seoul technically didn't have a finals, you know, acknowledging that that didn't really happen. She only made in that case one final. Um, otherwise she was a bit of a non-factor. Um, and, and I can't even speak that highly about her lead climbing either, which is kind of the, the sad part is it doesn't look like we're going to see her as a, as a main character very much this year. Um, it looks like it is going to stick with the, the typical set of women we've seen. Now she's still in the running to get in the Olympics, just the way that's structured and the country caps, you have to say like, there's a, still a good chance that she ends up at the Olympics representing Germany so maybe they say hey that means the season was a success uh, success and it worked out for us but narratively she was somebody on the come up and, uh, and it really didn't pan out the way we had kind of hoped and I want to acknowledge too uh, we went over the just the the tragedy that Ger the German team went through with of course, the loss yeah. of Christoph and I you know I, I I don't know if I don't know if that played into her mental state or not I I have no no idea but um, certainly doesn't make it easier yeah it certainly fair. doesn't make it easier so I don't want to I don't want to seem like we're kind of like piling on Hannah Moyle when we don't know the circumstances in terms of maybe there was some grief there. Maybe she was sick for for a prolonged period. I, I don't know. But like you said, I, I kind of really thought she was going to be a star this year. Didn't really see it. Maybe we'll see it in 2024. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's uh, let's go to Mike and we'll see how much this dovetails with mine. So, Mike, what's uh, what's your loser from this event? Well, I think there's one YouTube comment that kind of summed it up for me, which is uh, Aymari has neglected to train her height, um, which I thought was just absolutely, <laughs> absolutely brilliant, um, which it was, it was a funny way to, um, you know, it's, it's, it's good to, to lean on some comedy in a bad situation, but um, there was something going on in the women's boulder final. Um, I, I actually looked at the comments before watching the stream, which is Ooh. never usually a, a good way around of doing it. Um, and it was not as bad as, you know, obviously a keyboard warriors and all that, like you're saying, cap locks on kind of guys. It was, it was, it was not as bad as I was expecting, but I do think the, there is a trajectory in the climbing and route setting competition community um, um, around dynamic parkour style boulders. If we like to use those words, just for, for sake of argument right now, um currently i don't think um the mainstay of root setters are are really listening potentially um i don't have any like evidence to back that up i don't i haven't spoke to um any of the ifsc setters recently in the last few months um but overall personally i would like to see the community listen to a little bit more um and found that the set of four boulders in the women's final um to be not not the, the best set of boulders. Um, I don't think probably the root setters need me telling them that. They, they, the, the ones that I've met are just the most humble, um, 
people who are, who are easily able to reflect on their own boulders themselves and that there'll be there'll be no harsher critic than, than, than the guys in that team um and i'm definitely don't want to shit on the root setting team um that, that that's not what this is about but i think overall i think the the balance of styles and possibly how the walls are designed does need to be um i think a conversation need to get a few guys around the table and have a look at that um because the uh, the the round wasn't potentially the, exactly what we were looking for. I want to let's let's break it into specifics because I think the two boulders that got the most uh, grief were women's number one and women's number three. They were just the most obvious examples of um, of climbs where height probably played an important factor in how easy a particular move was. So let me just put them on the screen real quick. So if anybody, you know, it's been a few days since these rounds have happened. Um, so I'll just give a quick brief on on how they worked. And then I'd love to hear, Mike, just as a, as a root setter, your opinion on if if you think one or the other is particularly egregious or, or what you think is worth changing. If we start at women's one, and you really only need to see the first couple moves to understand, this is I Mori on, I think, her fourth, yeah, fourth attempt, I guess. It's a jump start. Mm -hmm. You're jumping straight from the mats up to a... Uh, it's basically a jug, but it's it's a jug with a couple little screw-ons in there. And of course, this is the very first thing uh, that we all see as we start the round of boulders. And she takes multiple attempts before even being able to hold on to the start hold. Um, it is a jug. It's not like, you know, necessarily a skill move. It is just a straight upwards jump to even establish on the boulder. Um, so this one kind of raised some red flags for me. The other one, just to point out, and I'll use Brooke as an example for this one. Uh, this mm. move, you get into the start, you're really kind of shoved into a corner where you feel a little bit trapped between the two black volumes for your feet and the large blue feature and the little black sphere for your hands. And you do have to do this kind of like outward push where you're jumping out and around some features and then hit this ledge. Uh, I really struggled with it. Brooke struggled with it as well. It wasn't as much of a problem for the other climbers who are all, you know, from a couple centimeters to quite a few centimeters taller than these two girls. Um, I was curious between these two boulders, like did one or the other really like kind of uh, make your hair prickle in terms of just like, nah, that's, that was kind of a failure versus, you know, some boulders work better for some people and they work better for others. Like that's just how it goes. What did you think uh, from those two? Yeah. Yeah, normally I'm I'm fairly relaxed about these things because um, it it really does vary. But this one I think was 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 not, you know, when the the start of women's one was not great. Sadly, um, I think the the move could have been avoided with um, a start off to the side that you often see um, a move into that swing with some maybe some dual texture undercuts or something that you can't you know you can't use for your feet pull in you, you, you smash out to that hold and then you can start swinging from that point onwards um there was one I'm, i was trying to rack my brain this morning i've seen a jump start like that in a world cup before but it was so long ago um i'm thinking it was in um slovenia like, like 10 years ago or something and it there was, was the, it the was famous a... one i remember was the what was it in innsbruck or kitzbühel 2013 or 14 and it was the one where Anna Storr like took one extra attempt and it cost her the season sweep but it was jumping up to like two two red mm. slopers but yeah it is actually that, a fairly yeah. rare move right it's not a common thing yeah. to see a straight up jump start from the yeah. floor and I have to say when I when I first put it on I was like, okay I'm gonna watch this from the beginning because I've seen the comments I know this is gonna be bad and and I even then I was still kind of like watching out the corner of my eye like this is hard to watch like this is yeah. embarrassing i mean obviously there, there was drama still when she caught it it was a it was a great moment of entertainment mm -hmm. like fair play like good effort um but it it, sh it probably shouldn't happen should it you know that's just we don't really need to see that i feel sorry for the root setters you know they would have they would have tried their absolute best to, to make that work she is really small um and um, but that move possibly it, it didn't didn't need it in that occasion. They, there could have been a setup move potentially that that could have could have uh, that could have helped out in that scenario. I think uh, women's three the the jump out the corner that was a tricky one again. Clearly, uh, Brooke and I there um, their, their legs are straight. You know they've got no spring out the legs. They're completely spanned out in the, the bottom as well. Um, but that's what I was saying about the the style of the boulders. This like you used to be. This is a jump boulder. That's a slab. That's a power board or whatever. But nowadays, all of those styles tend to be rolled into into not all of them at once, but multiple styles of, of root setting or climbing are rolled into one boulder. 
Um, so you might have um, a dyno that ends up being into a really crimpy technical section and some some other stuff on top. You don't normally get just with like one move. Um, and that has made that has made the root set's life even more difficult, I think. And there is a lot of pressure on them to put on the big show. But overall, I feel like the weight of dynamic style moves currently is tipped slightly too far um, towards that style. And some of the other styles have been... Um, not really neg neg neglected because there's many elements of that style throughout the rounds, um, but it's the standout move in the boulder that people will remember. And there's, there are too many, in my opinion, dynamic moves um, that that are becoming unfairly weighted towards slightly taller climbers. Because no matter how you wrap up the style of move, the classic A to B dyno, you know, we all remember back in the day the the actual dyno comp, the world record route, was was just like, who's the tallest, basically? Mm -hmm. um, and that style was completely watered down by having much more technical jumps. And that's, even when I'm teaching route setters today here in London, we talk about how to not make a route, uh, a dynamic route, um, breachy. But if you're leaving one position and heading to another, probably six times out of 10, it is going to benefit a taller climber. Um, it's just a it's just a distance thing, sadly. Um, and it is really hard to avoid. Um, however, when you have Yanya in the final, she is almost um, making a rod for her own back because she's so good at this style that she has allowed the root setters to push that style forward. That's inevitably only um solidifying her position as as being the better climber on those styles and you know the root setters are going with her but it is leaving others behind and when the boot when the roots and the dynamic style becomes more and more technical it's it's harder the jumps are probably further because they require more power if you're not good at that style you're you know you, you end up standing on the mats for three minutes not being able to um not being able to really sort of jump out of that second move like we saw on on women's number three um i think it's a tricky thing but i think the community would probably appreciate some maybe this is a uh, wishful thinking but some input from the ifc as to what what direction they do give the root setting teams and where we want to see things go um like i said um for me it's gone it's going slightly too far towards um uh too, too many jumps well, let me let me pose the the like the um, the counter to that that always gets mentioned, which is separating these athletes is nearly impossible. We need to introduce new levels of risk and complexity and 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 just new moves that people aren't used to and force them to improve mm. themselves on on the hardest stuff because it's the only way we have to separate them and we can't find a crimp small enough to separate these climbers and we can't find a slope or slopey enough to separate these climbers without adding some dynamics right so that's kind of like the the broad argument that gets mentioned when when people are defending the kind of if you want to call it parkour or skate or just bouldering of today frankly right it's not this is the stuff we're seeing in gyms a lot it's not comp setting specifically anymore it's just kind of like it's what bouldering is um so tell me what your counter to that is like do you think there is still a practical way to get separation between these like like if you talk about small crimps like i's got some of the smallest hands that have probably been on the circuit in the last decade um uh these kids have strength to weight ratios that are like completely bonkers and that's a separate topic to, to discuss how maybe some of these climbers are achieving that. Um, but how do you cope with that, right? Like we say a dynamic move, the more complex, the larger they get, it leaves it behind the smaller climbers. But isn't there kind of a, a trade-off in the opposite direction if we move towards climbs that just value possibly strength to weight ratio that creates maybe negative? So I don't mean to make it about body weight. Sorry, let me yeah. just forget that that happened. Are you able to separate all these climbers properly if you diminish the role of dynamic movement? Yeah, it, I, I was on the page of we have to do something different because it's, it's becoming impossible. These are just absolute monsters. And if we give them a, a holdable hold, it, it's it's not possible for us as route setting teams to keep up with the athletes. Can I, can I, I ask was, you really quick, like when approximately you started to feel that way? Um, I know it's a hard question, but just curious if... If there was a if there's a landmark moment in your head where you're like, oh damn, this is getting difficult. No, I think cards on the table. I have not set a World Cup, so I wouldn't be able to give a World Cup moment specifically. Of course, yeah. Um, but I think it's when it's when your own ability as a as a someone who's testing the roots clearly is is way away from where you need to be for the athletes. Um, so for me, I'm 37 now. Probably like my early 30s, I was like 
shit, I've just got no chance. You know, I'm going to have to dig into another toolbox to come up with something to get this comp to work. Um, and it, it and it is a is a nice toolbox to use. It works. It looks great. But when it doesn't work, it looks really bad. And that's kind of where we are, I suppose. Um, but in the last few years, I, I am starting to to question that. Like, surely we must be able to find a different way. If the root setters themselves, you know, some of these root setters are just utter beasts. Like they are underground. Like some of the strongest guys and girls out there. It's, it's ridiculous. Um, and I feel like maybe we've just been using that as a bit of an excuse. Um, and maybe there's another way of approaching it with, um, with, um, with some sort of uh, more of a program of root testers who are specifically there to help the team. Um, I know a lot of teams do use that, but um, a, a more of a, a contractual role around that that's a very specific job description that's consistent between the rounds. Somebody, uh, multiple people who are who are able to operate at the very, very highest level or just below it uh, operate that move off of the ladder. And I know this is very easy to sit here on YouTube and, and say, why don't you just do this, why don't you do that? It's, um, it's, a, it's a very, very hard problem to solve. But overall, I think we should give it a really good go. I think we should try try some other stuff and see see if we can make boulders that are genuinely like brick hard and, and see if that works. And we saw a men's final that wasn't um all in that style and it and it was it was really good to watch and it doesn't have to be um swinging around the, 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 i think it's there's a balance there's a balance to strike and for me if there's lots of dynamic moves as the first or second move i find that frustrating to watch and it can turn off the the audience quite quickly um but i think we need to look at different ways of of, of testing the boulders um, and and see if that helps um, again, not an easy problem to solve, and um, definitely not uh, cutting into any of the root setters here because it's 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 a tricky situation setting for such absolute monsters. John, do you yeah. have anything to add particularly about? I can't remember what the name of it was. You definitely remember more than I do. But wasn't there like an international forerunners association or something? Um, I'm trying to think of what that who was involved. Maybe it was just a U.S. thing. I can't remember what that concept was. Um, yeah. Sorry to put you on the spot with like a 30 year throwback, but that was, is a throwback. Yeah, I don't know. I'd, I'd have to really think about the exact name. Uh, and I'm and I'm already trying to think back to the comp you referenced. I'm racking my brain to think of what event it was where Honest Store wasn't able to do that jump to the right. red holds. I think that it's an event. I'm in my head. I kind of remember Eula Verm being able to do the move and then beating. Yeah. on a store as a result but yeah. i can't remember the venue but nonetheless um this does kind of focusing it back to maybe i mori and the and the height issue a little bit it does prompt a question is it is it bad to make tall height or fairly tall height a prerequisite for elite level climbing or elite level you know world cup climbers uh, of course, in a commercial setting, in a gym, it's a it's a totally different issue because you have to set for a, a wide customer base. You're going to get people that are tall, people that are short. But I, I don't know. I kind of waffle back and forth, but I a lot of times land on maybe a dissenting opinion here, which I don't know if it's that bad because as somebody who watches a lot of other sports and something and as somebody who reports on other sports from time to time, you see height is basically a prerequisite in most other sports think about like uh, uh, well i mean most obviously basketball right with a few exceptions you're not going to find pro basketball players that are five six five seven five eight right you need to be like six four six five six six and 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 up in professional football you see quarterbacks that are usually a certain height like they have to be fairly tall because they need to be able to see over the offensive line when they're throwing the ball that it helps to have that height advantage so i don't know if it's necessarily bad if we apply that standard to world cup climbers as well and you would say like somebody like i more yeah she's she's short and maybe too short to consistently make that jump but like you, you don't say that. Like apply that to any other sport, and it's kind of just like, well, shoot, those are the breaks, you know. Like some people are born six six, and some people are born five five. Uh, and and that's and of course, Tyler, as you said, there are other advantages that I has over competitors, and and she might be able to overcompensate for not having that height. But I don't know. I I suppose I 
when you compare it to other sports, I, I put the question back to to the two of you. Why shouldn't World Cup climbing be any different? Where there is a a, a certain uh, kind of like, yeah, you you kind of got to be a certain height to be able to compete at the highest level of this sport. I think that's a a very fair point. I think the hard part is it's, it's like for a for a sport that I I hate this phrase, but it it's a it is a common phrase in the industry, which is climbing is for everybody. And I think every time we notice a moment where ah shit, climbing climbing's not quite for everybody. Like what do we what do we do? Um, it's kind of uncomfortable. And I think particularly if if we have this sport and if we're actually seeing this visible change happening, where we're like, wow, climbing is becoming less and less acceptable for this body type. I think that does feel bad. And maybe it's a fair evolution. Maybe it is something to say like this is just where the sport's going, and this is you know this has happened in many sports over history. You go through periods where different body types, different types of people have. Uh, uh, you know, in in gaming, we would talk about a change in the meta, right? You know, just the the fundamentals of the game can ebb and flow over time, emphasizing different factors, and and others kind of recede into the background. Um, I had another point, I've lost it, so I'm gonna I'm gonna let it flow onto somebody else, uh, well, Mike. Well, if you had a point to that point, Mike, I'll, just... I'll, I'll let, just real quick here, Tyler. When you say yeah, the slogan for climbing that they, we always hear is climbing for every climbing is for everybody, but I don't think you can apply that nor should you apply that to a a world cup or an olympic level like by definition like yeah but also it's like it's an international sport in the olympics like it's it's a ton of it is just values and trying to be like this is you know this is for everybody you know it like there is a certain amount of like it is the ambition is to make it for everybody or we like to think it's that we like to think that competitive sport is this all embracing thing that everybody can participate in and we're going to create world peace and we're going to stop a war in russia like you know with our with our sport we can do it so i think there's a little bit of like there's a certain element element of that too yeah this, this is really interesting what you're saying there john and i was i was almost sort of drifting away from this conversation a bit just that just got me on a train of thought that was yeah i hadn't really thought along those lines before but to counter that i think if if you say like you essentially you need to be this height to progress in this well, then the semi-final or the qualifiers before it would have to be consistent with that to wean out those people there's no point in kind of going through that round and saying like Great, you can do these boulders, but you can't actually do the ones in the final. So sorry, um, that you know. So there, there's a bit of a tricky situation there, definitely. I think the other issue is that in in climbing, it's essentially a human being who makes a decision as to where the holes go and how far apart they are, um, and that that's tricky because that gives it automatically gives you somebody to blame if it doesn't go quite quite to plan. Um, I think the the way that I would progress thing is is let's have a conversation between you know, the top players in the industry, um, have a think about it. Just just don't ignore the fact and just kind of bury your head in the sand, just carry on. Um, and um, and, and see, see where you get, get to with that. You know, is this where we're going? Is this just a fashion at the moment? Is it going to progress? Obviously, it will progress. You know, Route Saint progresses, like, like we said earlier on in the conversation, you know, across the, across the world, people were trying things that they've seen this weekend, putting their own variations on the wall of that. Um, but I would just try to avoid the, the absolute kind of no-nos, which is jump starts off the mats where somebody clearly just can't reach the hold, sadly. Um, just try and avoid the, the really big clangers and um, and and see where the conversation goes after that. Um, but maybe a height and weight division in climbing is it's a conversation worth having, I think, as ridiculous as, as it may sound. We have a, a hard out, so I'm going to have to really like put a squelch on this. Um this is one of the few times where we've actually had to like end an episode before I wanted it to end, unfortunately. Um, my loser was going to be the iMori hype train, which I've renamed the iMori hype short bus, which is currently steaming on the side of the road, absolutely having fallen apart. So it was really just a meme point. The, I think the last the last thing I wanted to... Uh, man, I've lost this point again about iMori. How do I keep... Messing? Oh, this is what I wanted to say. Just for the context, we have just finished the entire Boulder season, and this was really the first time where there was an uproar this entire year that this came up. So just for the context of, it was a single finals round. It was the first finals round that Imori has made in a Boulder World Cup since 2019. So there's still a lot of learning going on to possibly how we're going to incorporate an athlete of this size and of this stature. Mm -hmm. And also learning on her end where she's a very inexperienced 
international competitive boulderer. Um, so I think there is an element of, you know, you're absolutely right. There's a certain amount of discussion to be had about it, but also let's see how it plays out. Let's see how it goes to the world championships um, and maybe the sport and the climber mature in a way where we can all find that balance. Because again, it is for the most part, not intentional, right? The root setters are not intentionally trying to exclude somebody from boulders, even though it, you know, it can be intentional in one direction and she becomes a, a side effect or collateral damage. But I think everybody is trying to aim for a, a fair playing field that can include all of the superstars in the sport. So uh, so at least there's for no sure. intentional evil at the very least. I am going to call it there. Um, so thank you, Mike, for joining us. Finally, we've been trying to get this going for, for quite a while this year. I'm so glad it happened and for such a good comp. Um, John, as always, thanks for taking the time as well. To everybody watching, thanks for watching all the way to the end. If you do watch to the end, you're the kind of person that we want in the Plastic Weekly Discord so we can chat about the comps as they happen with other people that are like-minded. So hop in there. It was a great time this weekend for Innsbruck. If you want, you can support this uh, podcast on Patreon or you can get stickers. I'm going to start a little video diary on there just for patrons so you can kind to like see a little bit of the behind the scenes stuff of how this goes you can also get some discord clout so you can lord it over other people on the internet which is ultimately what you know internet culture is all about uh, but aside from that thanks again for watching we got a week off and then we're going to be back into some lead comps and then of course the world championship coming up so thank you for staying tuned and we'll see you guys in the next one